In part one, Michaela Buckley guided us through some leadership sides of branding, um, which really means identifying the values and the goals of your brand in order to have a clear understanding of your mission and your brand, um, which in turn makes it easy to decide what projects and programs to do because you can answer the question, is this on brand for me with a simple yes or no? Um, so since we went through that, or well, if you weren't there for that one, we have that on our platform at this stage. Um, that is available um, on atthisage.la. And so today we're discussing how to begin building the visual aspect of your brand, which I know can be really daunting if your marketing and design experience is limited. Um, if you're teaching yourself or learning as you go, or if you're a small marketing team or even a marketing team of one. But it really doesn't have to be stressful. The tools and resources we have to share with you today are easy to use and will help make your visual branding more cohesive. But if this is new territory for you and as we're chatting questions come up, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. So today we're gonna be focusing on what a style guide and a branding packet are and how you can build these items. These two tools help lay the foundation for a unified visual brand and make it so easy to create items that are on brand. So what is a style guide and what is a branding packet? A style guide is used to define the way a brand looks and to keep graphics consistent across materials. I like to think of the style guide as the, as the blueprint. It holds the creative and visual elements and dictates how future collateral will look. Oftentimes a style guide is included in the branding packet. So a branding packet, which is also sometimes referred to as a branding package or a branding kit, is a collection of digital, printed, and physical resources that are used to create a uniform and consistent image of a brand. It consists of separate branded items un uh, unified with the same style and ideas, especially um, like kind of like templates. The templates are built based off the visual elements decided within the style guide. So we're going to move into. So we're first going to talk about the style guide. So I like to start with the style guide because again, uh, the style guide is, um, makes all of the creative and visual choices that then dictate what your branded collateral will look like. So a style guide outlines your color palette, your logo, and how your logo and, logo and variations of your logo are used, as well as typography details such as font families, sizes, and space between characters and lines. It is also really clear about design standards. Being able to put into words the look and feel of your brand is really important and can help you tremendously. We all have visuals that come to mind when we say things like minimalism, abstract, modern, vintage. Knowing your vibe will help you um, in achieving, or will actually help you in the visual research process. And also when you're collaborating with others to achieve a certain look. Another thing outlined in a style guide is layout specifics. For example, how elements are positioned on a page. This certainly isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but all of these elements um, in the PowerPoint are definitely should be in your style guide because they help lay that foundation. So building the blueprint. So this is one example of a style guide. This one's pretty simple. You can see they've included their logos, both primary and secondary, as well as logo variations and information on spacing. They've included color palette information and their font family. However, it is just their supporting type typography. So this is um, a decent style guide, but it's pretty bare bones. Um, by looking at the style guide, I can assume their primary font maybe matches their logo, but it's not clear. And if you work for an organization or a company, you wanna provide as much clarity as you can to support succession planning. You never know, or uh, you never want one person on your team holding all of the information. You want to be able to create guides that your team and future successors can actually utilize. However, this example may be good for your own personal branding. Uh, but again, keep in mind that this applies to both individuals and organizations. And if you're wanting to partner and collaborate more or on a larger scale, there may be the occasion where um, you're asked to submit your logo or your branding so collateral or marketing materials can be created. And being able to send a clear style guide that outlines exactly how to use your branding helps ensure that everything with your name on it is on brand and represents you the way you want to be represented. 
So another example of a blueprint or a style guide um, is this one. And so as you can see, it has a bit more information. It includes a full gradient for the color swatches, as well as material swatches that depict the kind of texture they're using in their designs. Their primary and secondary fonts and examples, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, and examples of how the font looks with different cases is included. Um, that way you get a full visual uh, analysis happening, you really understand what's going on. Um, they also include more logo examples, including contextual examples and sub-brands. So you might have multiple programs or projects that you want to categorize, and these sub-brands are a great example of how to represent different areas of your work while keeping visual unity. Again, you can always add more information. I personally don't think you can have too much information in a style guide, especially if you're sharing it um, in hopes of collaborating. Um, also, another example is I'm on the marketing committee for Emerging Arts Leaders Los Angeles, and we use a lot of kind of fun and funky design elements. So we have those smaller vector art graphics included in our style guide, which aren't depicted in either of these. But it's a really easy way to just pull in those elements when we're working on design. Cool. So we're going to get into some tools and resources that are really easy, and a lot of them are free, which is really, really great, especially if you're working on your own personal branding. Um, so yeah, so but I just want to say a style guide doesn't have to be stressful or difficult. Again, I'm going to show you just a few of many, many resources out there. But the most important thing is that you allow yourself to be creative and try and explore, which can be really, really hard, um, even for designers who are used to kind of putting together this visual creative process, putting ourselves out there and putting together something that truly represents us can be really nerve wracking. Um, at LA Stage Alliance, our director of IT, Mark Dorr, he often says um, that you can't wait for something to be perfect. You kind of just have to go for it and adjust along the way, which amongst our team, like Michaela and I, we tend to fall a little bit more into a perfectionist mindset and having that reminder that you can't wait for it to be perfect. You kind of just have to go for it and just see what works and fix along the way. And I think when you're starting to do um, your own personal branding or company branding, sometimes you're held back because you're like, well, what if I'm wrong? What if they don't like it? What if, like my colleagues, the company? There's all those kinds of hesitations, but you just got to take the first step and start exploring. So the first resource, and I always talk about this because I think it's such a great resource, is Canva. Um, I talk about Canva all the time because I genuinely love it. I've used it for about five years now. Um, it is a free graphic design program. It's full of templates that are accurately sized for any and all of your marketing and design needs, as well as um, it has a wealth of vector art and graphics you can use for free. One of my favorite things about Canva is how easy it is to resize and reproduce graphics. And this is really, really helpful for keeping things on brand and visually unified because you're ensuring it's the same fonts, it's the same font sizes, spacing, and so on. You can also access a huge library of stock photos that are free to use and many don't even require crediting. Um, plus, they offer lots and lots of free resources and guides because so much of their audience is self-taught and learning as you go, as many of you may be. Um, it's really, really great to access and kind of educate yourself if maybe your background isn't in design. And also, if you work for a nonprofit, you can access Pro for free. Um, I believe all you have to have is a 501c3 status, and it just takes a few minutes to fill out the application. Another really great thing about Canva is, specifically on the topic of branding, is they have a built-in brand kit in their program that you can easily access and pull, add, and customize as you're designing. Um, I wouldn't recommend this as a place like in place of your style guide because you can't export it and it only outlines logos, colors, and font families. But if you're working in Canva, uploading these details makes designing so much easier. Another really great resource as you're building your style guide and kind of exploring what your brand looks like is Adobe Color. So, Adobe Color allows you to easily explore color palette options and compare harmony rules, such as monochromatic, complementary, and compound color palettes. And it gives you the color code, so you're making sure you're using the exact right um, shades that you want to be using. It also has this really great feature where you can import a graphic or an image 
and use the extract theme tool. So you can import your logo or a key graphic that really represents your brand or even a mood board, which I have a trick for that in a minute that I'll show you. And it'll start to, and it'll just pull the colors right out. So you can explore different color themes. So I use the example of like, this is just an image I had on my computer because I used it recently on our social media and it pulled the colors right out. And again, like you can select along the side here of suggested palettes that you can go for that have a little bit more like, are they colorful, are they bright, is it a little bit more muted, depending on what you're looking for. Another really great tool is um, Google Fonts. Now, it doesn't have all of the fonts that exist in the world, there are very, there's tons, but it does have all of the Google Fonts. And Google Fonts are very popular and they're widely used. Um, you can explore tons of styles and it even recommends pairings for that font. And the great thing about Google Fonts is you can download and use the fonts for free. I've done this and then uploaded them to Canva and websites and into the Adobe Creative Suite. Again, allowing you to keep all of your collateral and visuals cohesive. Cool, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through the process a little bit, starting with visual research. So visual research, I actually think is the most fun in all of this, because you're really just kind of exploring. So I'm gonna show you, um, both for personal branding and organizational branding, what this can look like. And if you're learning on behalf of an organization, I really recommend going through the personal branding process for yourself. It's a really good exercise in exploring and being creative. And I feel like it doesn't have the same amount of pressure because it's just for you and you're just making choices around what you like. So I like to use Pinterest when I'm doing visual, re visual research. Um, I think it's an easy way to build and pull from other sources and explore, create a mood board of a sense. Um, and because of Pinterest, Pinterest's algorithm, it curates and recommends images for you. So as you can see in this screenshot where it says more ideas, those are pins I haven't added to my board, but are similar, which can be really helpful. For personal branding, I like to kind of just go through and see what naturally catches my eye. I try to lift any mental expectation of what I think I want and just go with what is interesting and just plain and simple, just what I like. I'm, during this stage of the process, I try not to intellectualize too much, just see what catches your eye. Then, once you have a decent amount of images, kind of curated already, then I start to kind of analyze. So what common colors are coming up? What general themes are popping up amongst these visuals? Um, and what images are repeatedly catching my eye? So this is a really great place to start when you're feeling not so sure where to start. Um, just let your natural taste kind of guide you through that personal branding process. Then once you've identi identified the general mood and the vibe, you can start to be more critical. You can begin to tailor and customize from there. And then I have a really, I like to think of it as a hack of what you can do once you've kind of created this visual mood board, visual research. Let me show you that. So what I like to do is take a screenshot of my mood board, my visual research, and then I drop it right into that Adobe color and it'll pull the color schemes out for you. So for me personally, like I love the color pink, but when I started working on my own personal branding, when I was like, oh, I should maybe make a website, I was like, well, I don't think I want to use solely pink just because there are still some negative connotations about, you know, people who are a little bit more feminine, like pink, those kinds of things. And I didn't want my intelligence to be equated with those connotations. But so I created this visual mood board, just things that naturally caught my eye, screenshotted it, pulled it into Adobe Color, and it pulled out some of these colors that I didn't even realize were in there or repeatedly in there um, that I really like and that are really on brand for me and still feel very much like me. So if you're kind of struggling with like, I don't really know exactly like where to start with that, that's a really great way to just kind of be like, well, let someone else kind of do the work for me a little bit. So then from there with personal branding, uh, I decided my color scheme, which I decided on a little bit more like muted colors. Um, I really jived with like muted gray blue tones, so I decided that would be my primary color. But you can also see I added in some of those orange, green, and red tones that I really liked. I also pulled some key graphics that I had already made and wanted to stick with, 
around these, I created some language around what my brand looks and feels like. So I could say like my brand has like a, like a modern minimalism that has hints of like retro magazine publications with a color scheme that kind of reminds me of like 70s film, something like that. Like that's a general vibe that we could say. And again, feels very accurate for me. So once you've started to be able to kind of identify and create language around those things, then you can start putting together some branding. So with that, I started building. And honestly, making a personal site was like pulling teeth for me. <laughs> I have a very specific aesthetic on my Instagram that I really love, but I was nervous about transferring that to a personal site where I wanted to talk more about my professional experience. Um, but this is where part one of the series that Michaela talked us through really comes into play. Because I knew what my personal mission was for my site, it made it easier to start you know, taking those designs and those visual steps. I identified really early in this process that I wanted a way to establish narrative around my kind of multi-hyphenate career experience, which I know a lot of you have also, are also in that same boat. Um, and I also wanted to be able to showcase like my visual work and my experience in arts education, and also just kind of have a place where I could express my thoughts. Especially like in quarantine, I've been like dying to do something creative and I decided to blog in a sense. Um, so that's really exciting. And I wanted to make sure the site could host all of those different aspects of myself. Um, so knowing that I wanted to showcase all of that, I decided to go with a minimalist feel, which was already kind of evident in my taste, which I analyzed from my visual research. And again, the site is literally so new. I've been hesitant to publish anything or make the site live because it's not exactly what I want it to be just yet. But um, by making the decision to not let my perfectionism stall my creative exploration and my projects anymore, I was able to actually make progress and it feels really good. It feels really exciting. Um, so now, how do we implement this process for an organization or a company? We're gonna talk through that a little bit. So we have a platform, we have a program called Onstage LA, which is a, the one-stop shop for you know, all things LA theater. And during quarantine, we decided that we really wanted to promote the platform and share it with our community, make sure our folks have access to the amazing things our companies and our theaters are doing. So we decided to develop a campaign for it. So I figured I'd share a little bit on the inside of what that looks like, because it's very much what a branding process looks like. So we're gonna get into that. Um, so with onstage.la, when I began the branding process, some of these elements were already decided for me, such as fonts and colors, which if you're working for a company or an organization, that might be a little bit more what's happening because you know some programs have already existed, logos often already exist. So part of my research was really thoroughly exploring the platform. And at first glance, I was like, oh man, like this is really minimalist. I'm not sure what kind of elements I can add to the marketing that will still be on brand and match the site. Um, however, I kept exploring and I started to notice how cleverly the site implemented the visualization of tickets. So there's like half circle cutouts, dashed lines, a lot of rectangular shapes that with the font selection look a lot like ticket. So, and ticketing is a huge part of the site. Um, and we had already decided that the marketing would strongly emphasize that portion of like one-stop shop Get your, get your tickets, get your online events listed, that kind of thing. We already knew that was something we wanted to emphasize. So this gave me somewhere to really start exploring in the visual research. Um, I explored publications and prints that used our fonts and colors, and then started exploring elements, which is where I really fell in love with the kind of retro, uh, like fine line ticketing layouts, which is ultimately, ultimately what a lot of the branding looks like. So from there, so this is just, again, a very simplified version of kind of a style guide. Um, and with all these things in mind, I started to build the branding packet or building collateral that was on brand. So colors and fonts were easy. As I said, they were already determined. Um, and I added in details about the visual elements that I wanted to use, such as monoline or fine line, which looked really consistent with the website's existing design. I added in some kind of like, exciting sparks that give a kind of modern minimalism take on like the old Hollywood dazzling kind of elements like we got some stars and some pops which kind of they incorporate very nicely into that fine line and still match the branding but add a little bit of excitement 
And so I started to design the graphics and I, imp I imported them into the same Pinterest board in a different section so that it was all in one place, which leads me to the branding. So please note that I cut these visuals small. Um, I don't wanna give away too much because we're still rolling out this content. We're very excited to bring it to our community and have it as a resource. But you can see that the overall look and feel um, is very cohesive. It's very bright, it's very fun. Um, yellow is our main color. And honestly, at first, like I was, because that was the primary color and the secondaries were like hot pink and bright blue. I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, I feel like these colors are like, kind of overwhelming. It works on the website because it's backed by a lot of white, but I didn't want our Instagram and like our aesthetic to be all white with just little pops. But then I started, it was part of the visual research, is I was like, okay, well, what brands do I know that incorporate like a lot of yellow? And I thought of Bumble. And so I started exploring Bumble's like branding and things like that. And I want you guys to know that's part of visual research. Like that is, I feel like sometimes people think like that's cheating or something. Like you have to come up with it all on your own. That's definitely not true. Like use the resources that are available, explore other people's designs. Like Michaela mentioned this in the first part of this series of recognize what brands you already know and love because they did this whole same process. So start kind of just picking up on it, um, picking up on visual elements and what catches your eye. So now we're gonna get into the branding packet. So you've already kind of done the legwork of building the style guide. As you can see, that's a lot of like the decision making of like, okay, what is this actually gonna look like? And when you've made those decisions and put that style guide together, building the branding packet is actually really, really easy. Because you've already, you have the blueprint, you're just making those decisions, making those templates. Um, and to be clear, some folks do use the term style guide and branding packet interchangeably. Um, as we saw on like Canva, they use like branding kit, um, whereas I would call that more of like a style guide. But just be clear, like if you're collaborating with other folks or, you know, bringing this to your team that everyone's on the same page and that'll make things a little bit easier. So to refresh your memories, a branding packet is the collection of your digital, printed, and physical resources that you use to create a uniform image of a brand. It has separate branded items that are united with the same styles and ideas. As with the style guide, the following is not a complete list. You customize based on your own needs and goals, um, but these are some basics that I think everyone and every brand should have. So I kind of broke up into three sections. You have your digital assets, which are graphics and materials used on the internet, social media, in your emails, things like that. The first of this is actually your website. Your website is a key player in your brand. It should represent your visual brand the best, if nothing else. And it can actually give you a lot of insight. Like if your brand or if your website already exists, as I did with OnStage, take key elements from that to build your, your style guide and have that inform your other brand, branded materials. Then we move into things like email headers and campaigns. If you send emails from a CRM, um, or even if you don't, you can build templates that have consistent headers and footers and set default styles to match what is outlined in your style guide. Same goes for your email signatures. Everyone at your organization should have a standard email signature that is on brand. Um, and if this is for your personal, you can use tools like, um, oh, I really like HubSpot. They have um, like an email signature generator that's really customizable and makes it look really nice and you don't have to put in that much thought. and it you can make it come out exactly on brand for you. I really like that tool. Um, also, you wanna make sure all your logos and banners used on your social media are consistent and match the style guide. Um, build templates that are the correct sizes so you can just easily copy and customize. Again, Canva is a really great one for this. Um, I use that for pretty much all of our graphics, unless there's something that has to be in the, um, like an illustrator, file format, um, I use Canva for like everything. Um, and then any of your other digital marketing, just be sure to build templates that follow your style guide and you can customize as needed. Going into print assets, it's the same kind of thing. So you have your business cards, letterhead, um, envelope design, collateral pieces like your flyers and brochures and your media kit, and even thank you cards. Um, just make sure you build these templates in the rules of your style guide. And then lastly, for events, make sure to build um, 
or to have templates for event branding materials as well as signage. And when you have all these things done and designed in advance, it saves so much time and energy down the line and ensures that your messaging and marketing are unified with your brand identity. So I'm gonna show you some examples like with LA Stage Alliance, how we've kind of done that. Um, and this is the last part of today's conversation. And after this, we're, I'm happy to chat, answer questions. Um, and I'm just gonna, again, show you some examples from LA Stage Alliance. Our organization uses a lot of kind of like modern minimalism and geometric shapes. And that's clear from our logo. So, and again, like the logo was something that was like, you know, I wasn't super involved in that design process. I didn't design our logo. Um, but from that, I was able to identify the key elements to implement in our, in further branded materials. They were designed all around the same principles. So as you can see, like for example, we have our logos and then like our business cards. So they match in style, right? They kind of have that geometric minimalism. The font is very modern. Um, again, matching in style. The next example of this is our digital assets that match as well. Again, the minimalism allows me to create social media graphics that have some more color to them, but are still on brand. So it gives a little bit of room to explore and kind of be creative, but still on brand. Um, the green graphic above is a really great example of a tweet template that I've created um, because I use that a lot like on our social media, just as general content that I use. I share like funny tweets I see, but I take the text, instead of just posting like, a screenshot of the tweet, I take the text from it and format it so it's on brand for us. And also that, I mean, that's like a whole other conversation, but it also helps with like the reach and the engagement of our social media accounts. But again, main thing is that when you see it, has that visual unity and still matches even with a color variation. And then lastly, like for example, for this uh, chat, we have our marketing. So our marketing has the same kind of black and white rectangular elements, um, and they always, always, always use the same font families. Um, again, I made these in Canva. Um, I start by making the first graphic, the Instagram, Facebook kind of general square. And then from that, I could just easily copy and resize and create other materials that look the same. And it was so easy to make once I put in the work for the first one. And everything else looked on brand, looked cohesive. Um, I've even done this for our PowerPoints. So like our PowerPoints are a great example of a piece of branded collateral. We have, um, I think about five different PowerPoints with different colors, but they all have the same elements so that folks who work for LA Stage Alliance can just duplicate them, work in them, and it all still looks the same without having to have like one person constantly being sent things to be like, oh, please make this look like pretty, you know? Um, yeah, so again, we're using all of these key visual elements to create consistent branding. Again, this is by no stretch of the imagination like an exhaustive list, this is like just the beginning. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have. I know that's like, it can be a lot, especially if you've never really done this, especially if you're doing it for yourself. So, yes. Let me get out of here so I can see everyone's faces easy. That was awesome. Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, of course. Lots of information, so I apologize. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I know you definitely transitioned a lot of our branding into kind of newer trends, but that's something that still felt very true to LA Stage Alliance. Could you talk about kind of like how you made that shift? Yeah, totally. So we had, we recent, well, not recently, within the last year, we transitioned logos and font families. Um, we've been using our old fonts and logos, I think it was, it was for definitely a couple of years. Um, again, like that process looked a lot like that visual research of going through the materials that already existed and figuring out what was similar, but not too different, but still was a little bit more modern, a little bit more trendy if you will um because the key the big part the point in all of this is that when you create a unified brand that's consistent it helps people trust you because they see it they know it's you um and it kind of creates like a sense of reliability so we didn't want to stray too drastically far from what we had before 
Um, but I think it was doing that visual research, knowing where we've been, kind of what we were looking forward to evolving to and building that bridge. So not just like drastic making that jump. I was wondering why the color was yellow. That was, that was the creative genius of Mark Dorr. When he first established on stage, he used uh, the, his primary colors were yellow, pink, and blue. Um, so when I d selected yellow, I selected it because it was, to me, it felt like it stood out the most amongst all of our other programs. I manage our program at this stage, which the colors are, the primary color is pink, which again was done on purpose to kind of flow into the existing design market already established, um, but had some variation of its own, but still that connection. But so I really wanted to emphasize yellow and especially cause like it felt really exciting. It kind of reminded me of like spotlights um, and lighting on the stage, but also like California sunshine. So I really, and a big part of this is the big tourist push. Like we want to be like increase awareness of LA, uh, on stage LA as a resource of LA theater, so that kind of connection. What are good tips for small teams on scheduling posts being consistent on social media? This is like one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, and the art, our staff has heard me talk about it a lot over the past few weeks. Um, I love scheduling apps. Um, I think people don't always recognize that social media takes a lot of time. It's a very conscious process. It's very intentional. Um, I think, because I mean, we use, we use it for different things, you know, in our own lives, we might just be like, oh, my dinner looks super cute. I'm going to snap a pic and post it. It's not necessarily the same process for social media. Um, I personally use the app Later, Later.com. Um, I prefer it over Planoly, which I used for a long while. But Later, you can do from your desktop, which I think is really nice, especially like, again, be kind to your social media managers, because being on your phone a lot, especially lately, is really draining. So being able to kind of compartmentalize that for myself was helpful of like, when I'm at my computer, I'm working on work, and being able to schedule posts from my computer was really helpful. And also, I was able to do so many more in advance and preview what my feed would look like. So they have a feature, and a lot of scheduling apps do this, where you can preview what it looks like on your phone, which is really helpful. Um, as well as tracking engagement and clicks and things like that, and linking. The linking system, I think, in later.com is one of the best I've ever seen. So I really thank you, Michaela, for dropping in that in the chat. Later.com, high key recommend. But there's lots of other scheduling apps if you feel like that's not the one for you. Great. Are there any other questions? Yeah, no problem, Jackie. Anytime, girl. Anytime. Uh, do you mind us with tell, telling what okay. are we on for later? Yeah, we actually just upgraded ours with the nonprofit discount, which was such a resource. So again, if you have 501c3 status, the application process took me like two minutes. It was like four questions. You mainly just have to submit like your letter confirming that you are in fact a 501c3 and you get 50% off. So I think we're on premium schedule if I remember correctly because we have three social media handles and I wanted to be able to manage um, and enhance all of them using this platform so I think I'm on premium but I did start on the free one with just which I think is really really great again if you're just managing one account uh, or one handle they it lets you do like all the all the various platforms but um, the free one works really great you just might find if you are managing a lot of accounts that you might have to upgrade. Do I have a rule of thumb for what types of fonts to use for headings, subheadings, and body text? Yes, I do. So general, general rule of thumb with most design is like the rule of three, spacing, fonts, colors. Rule of three is always really good. Again, I love Google font. Um, I did that for LA Stage Alliance's branding. I did that for um, my own personal branding. I like to do, I like to think of it as like, your more statement font as your primary, right? Like your logo, your big headers, um, your subheading. I tend to like your subheading and your paragraph text. I like to keep them a little bit thinner, a little bit 
you know, easy to read modern, especially if your primary font is doing a lot more heavy lifting. Does that quite make sense? Is that kind of visual balance? Like if you have, great, perfect. It's a good idea to ask whether or not. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing how you convert tweets into Instagram posts that fit your brand? Oh yeah, I, that, okay. If you're managing social media, utilize that. Utilize resharing other people's content. Again, it's not cheating. Like, I am a meme queen, that is true. Um, especially like for our brand, when I first got hired, me and Michaela had a lot of conversation around like what kind of messaging we wanted to utilize and what kind of engagement we wanted to have. And we wanted to kind of strike the balance. We looked to girl boss a lot as a brand of like, okay, we want to kind of strike that balance between professional development, but also like we're human beings who want to laugh. And especially with social media, like most people use social media for fun. Like you, that's why TikTok is as popular as it is. It's fun. It's dynamic. Um, so what I do with tweets is I actually have tons of screenshots on my phone. I save tons of things into files on like Instagram if I see things I like. Um, so with tweets specifically, I see them, I'll, they come across like my Instagram a lot just because I engage with a lot of like theater content. Um, I then go to the actual tweet itself. I copy and paste the text in. I take a screenshot of their profile picture um, and then kind of format it to look the same as the tweet. But then in the bottom, I put like our handle. So then when it gets shared and things like that, people are seeing the at LA Stage Alliance handle in there. But it still looks like a tweet. You can still identify it as a tweet. Um, and so that's kind of what that conversion process looks like. Again, like keeping things on brand. Like for the tweets, I generally try to find things that are funnier. Um, they're like during ovation season, Howard Ho had posted a tweet about his mom being stoked about his ovation award. So we like reformatted that to share out just because that was relevant um, and relevant to our community. So that's kind of how, again, I think when you have like a clear idea of like your goal and your mission and how you want to communicate, it makes it easier to select the content you're sharing. Um, and I would also just mention like when you're having these conversations with your marketing and social media person, have an open mind. Um, I used to be LA Stage Alliance's marketing person and then my job shifted a little and then we hired Courtney. And so yeah, me and Courtney have very different personal styles and like personal aesthetics for our own brands. Um, but being able to have that flexibility and being open-minded, like I, when I was our marketing person, I never thought about doing this tweet thing. It just never occurred to me. So um, making sure, and I know a lot of people when they hire a marketing person, they're like, I only want you to post about this event that we're doing. I only want you to create content that's going to help me sell tickets. And that's not always what social media is about. And so really being able, and your marketing person is just as important to the content of what you're creating. Um, so like, if you're, if you have a show, like you should hire your con your social media curator and content creator at the same time you hire like your actors or your stage manager or your designers. Um, so that's just, yeah, listen to your marketing people. They have such great ideas. How, yes, I agree. I 100% agree. And especially like when you consider like, I think about our staff a lot. Like Michaela has a very minimalist feel. I have kind of a funkier feel. Mark has a little bit more, I feel like a classic feel. And our executive director has a definitely like gothic vibe. And so it's kind of learning to mold and mend these things because your people are what make your organization great a lot of the time. Um, but also being open-minded as to like, what is our brand and not just what am I bringing to this brand? How would you approach a campaign when you have a boss who is not so open-minded? How can you manage up? Lordy, okay, <laughs> yeah. So especially like with social media, um, because if you think about it, like Instagram, even though it's social media, it's a marketing tool. Like people use it to sell products now to make influencers, I think are one of the smartest people on this planet. They're utilizing it to make money. 
to be their own boss, I think it's awesome. Um, I think you have to keep in mind though that the perception of social media and these kinds of campaigns, um, like I, I am younger, look younger, um, all those things. And social media is seen as kind of like a young person, vapid thing often, um, and not always taken as seriously. So I think having that information in mind, but also knowing your data, knowing your statistics, knowing what works, being able to bring that information is really valuable. Cause I get that a lot. Like it's hard to explain, like, if you are working with someone who maybe is a little bit older, who doesn't use social media as much, who isn't really in the digital marketing game, um, again, they can kind of see it as like, oh, it's so easy. Like we can post on social media two weeks before a show and we'll be sold out. And you're like, no. So being able to come into the conversation with all the information you need of like, actually, you know, social media is a year round engagement strategy and commitment. And it's a communication tool, especially for nonprofits. Um, having that data, that information, I think is a really great way to kind of like manage up. And it's kind of, and especially like if you do it in a way of like, don't make the person you're trying to communicate with feel dumb. Um, I think we're seeing a shift, you know, between older marketing strategies into this newer wave of digital marketing. Like, again, it's called digital marketing when it's just marketing. Um, so oftentimes people can feel you know, dumb if they're not totally on it. So I think bearing that in mind, coming from a place of just like, I have this information, I want to share it with you. This is a really exciting opportunity. Um, I think that really helps in that kind of managing up conversation. What was the email signature generation site? Ah, HubSpot. That thing is a gold mine. <laughs> Again, if you're doing marketing for yourself or you're a solo marketing team or a small marketing team, that site has so much information um but yeah so it's hubspot email signature generator yes thank you michaela it's awesome i've used that for my own personal like email signature and you can even copy it and have your if you're on a team like have everyone use the same one so it all looks cohesive it's awesome how do you measure the effectiveness of your branding efforts or can you yes you definitely can um again like this could be a larger conversation of utilizing social media um these branding efforts you see the effectiveness of them in your data so on social media you have data that you can collect um oftentimes people just think of that as like how many likes am i getting how many followers do i have those are actually often considered vanity metrics because they you know they make you look good but you want to look at um your engagement your reach, your impressions, how many, you know, like lead to sale are you generating, which you can look at by um, utilizing the data to see, okay, off this specific branding campaign, after, like or awareness campaign that we did, did this generate more leads? Did this generate more sales? Like for LA Stage Alliance, for example, we're in the process of relaunching uh, on state, or not relaunching, but really doing this really great big push, this campaign to bring it to our community. So we're following and analyzing that data as we go to see what are people really responding to. Um, again, with things like that, with branding especially, a lot of times, if you're starting from scratch, please, please, please know that branding takes time. Building a following, and an organic and authentic following takes time. Um, I know folks buy followers, people can buy likes. Um, that doesn't help you in a sense. Again, because those are considered vanity metrics. Like, yeah, your numbers are gonna look good on the surface, but then, so it's like, if I have 3,000 followers on Instagram, but then you go down and look at my picture and it only has 60 likes, the engagement is really, really low. And that's because maybe I bought those followers or they aren't organic followers. Um, so they're not actually engaging with my content. So that's not generating any sales for me. That's not generating any lead for me. Um, so it's really important to measure that data and really understand that data. But that's a whole conversation we can definitely have if folks are interested. And I would say with measuring your data as well, um, that also takes time because you need something to compare it to. So uh, we tend to compare 
metrics by Ovation Awards. Um, like where was our follower at the last year? Where was our followers at this year? And this was a really interesting year for us because last year I did the marketing for the Ovation Awards and this year Courtney did the marketing for the Ovation Awards and being able to see, and while like the structure was the same, the branding was really different and her branding skyrocketed. It made such a bigger difference. And, but we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't already started tracking last year's. So start tracking now to continuously see what's working and what's not. Definitely. And I will say um, on that same topic, because I know a lot of folks here, you know, you work with theater companies. Um, we also saw that, and again, because we were tracking this data from as soon as I started working here, which was the end of last February. Um, we recognize that like, oh, we have a huge spike in engagement just around the Ovation Awards, which makes a lot of sense because we do a huge marketing push. It's the program we're most known for. It's our most front-facing program. So it makes sense that we have a huge spike just around that time period. But so what I gathered from that and what we decided to do was to try to push our year-round engagement, which then also led to a much larger engagement around this year's Ovation Awards. So it's not just entirely that like we switched hands and our branding's a bit different, but it was also because we really invested in communicating with our, with our people all year round. Um, and for theater companies, I think that's really important because I think sometimes we forget and we, you know, it's typical marketing standard of like, okay, we're about a month out. Like we're going to start, this is our schedule. This is what we're going to do. Whereas you should be investing in that conversation with your community year round. And it's the same for personal brands. Like how are you talking to your audience? How are you engaging with them? It's not, it's not just when you want something. Um, a, lot, a good rule of thumb that I like to use is 80% of your content should be educational and fun. We're not asking anything of you. We're just here to connect with you, talk with you, entertain you if we can. And the other 20% is an ask. I, I know especially now like with the quarantine and with a lot of theaters struggling right now, the temptation to just be like, please donate, please donate, please donate all the time is really strong. And I totally understand that. That makes a lot of sense. You have to keep in mind the mindset of folks um, and that it's exhausting to kind of see that content constantly. So you got to be very strategic about those asks. Great. Do folks have any other questions? I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> You're great. That was awesome. Great. Thank you, guys. I, I would love to push real quickly just the, uh, you were talking really quick about the, um, the idea of the asking and now and that we you know we did a, a one of these chats a few weeks ago with Matt Lerman uh, out of Arizona who talked about crisis engagement and that and so if you are on this uh, chat and you haven't viewed that one uh, you should really check that out that's a fantastic thing about how to communicate right now specifically in these kinds of times uh, with your um, with people who are uh, your uh, constituents I guess would be a good way to say it very true. And I just dropped in the chat. We have a Google form um, for you to access the PowerPoint from today. You'll drop your email in there. And so if you drop your email, I'll send you these materials that we're referring to both Matt's and the part one of this series with Michaela, because they are all definitely connected. Um, and I know I sometimes talk a little fast when I'm excited and nervous, but, and there's a lot of information in here. So access that PowerPoint, shoot me an email. If you know, if you have more questions, I'm always happy to talk. Thank you. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm out here making a making a fool of myself trying to make y'all laugh. So the all the amazing content that Courtney creates for us. I mean it. She's a mean queen. Thank Add you. Again, time. repost it. Make easy content for yourself. You don't have to think about it. I'll do it for you. Cool. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Following now. Woo! Great. Woo! I love I love the people we get for these conversations the last one and this one folks are so wonderful and uh, if you are interested in learning more about on stage and part participating in that collaborative brand uh, branding campaign go ahead you can email um, I'll drop my email in the chat but also just reach out to any of us and we can talk about getting you involved there we go Great one, guys.
Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. <laughs>